I am live. Hello, everybody. It's been a while. Going to wait for everybody to log on right now. Oh, and it's happening fast. I am a little bit nervous. This is a very, very exciting live for me and for all of us to be a part of. I want to thank everyone for joining and being a part of this with me. You all may notice that um, Bright Minded Studios is a little bit different. I'm actually in my recording studio. Um, this is where I come when I need to feel inspired. And um, <laughs> I don't know how I could feel more inspired than to introduce Senator Kamala today. Kamala Harris is gonna talk about what's at stake. And um, Senator Kamala has been fighting for the issues that matter to everyone, like healthcare and having a job and equal rights. As California Attorney General, she fought for things that changed lives like Obamacare and helping win marriage equality for everyone. As a Senator, We've seen her holding the Trump administration accountable and speaking out against Trump's conservative Supreme Court nominations. Her nomination for Vice President of the United States made history because she is the very first black woman and the first person of Indian descent on a major ticket. So it is my honor to introduce Senator Harris. I can't believe I'm adding Senator Harris right now to my life. Oh, this is, I'm nervous. Miley! Hello! Hi! How are you? Wait, I wait. am honored in a, kind of a state of disbelief right now that I have you on my live. It is an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, I'm glad to be with you. How are you doing? You know what, like everybody else, it's it's, this is a perfect time to ask you my, my first question I have for you because um, recently I think now knowing we're months into something that's starting to, it never felt quite normal, but it's been tough and exhausting and challenging yeah. and strenuous on all of us, um, especially yeah. emotionally. Um, and I think everyone's been having a tough time staying hopeful. So yeah. how yeah. have you been accomplishing that or what have you been feeling yeah. emotionally and, and how do you stay hopeful in times that we're witnessing right now? I mean, that's a great point. Um, I've been, you know, running the gamut of the emotions, right? Um, I've, I have felt great sadness, you know, when I think about, you know, one of the things I've been talking about and I've been traveling the country, as you can imagine, the, the number of people who, the, the 220,000 people who died over the last several months and in particular, those who, because of the nature of COVID, right, couldn't be with family in their last hours, right? And those family members that couldn't be with them. I've heard so many stories about that. They've tried to at least FaceTime, but couldn't physically hold the hand of someone, you know? Um, and that makes me very sad. Um, you know, we're, we're hearing about one in five mothers uh, who was describing her children under the age of 12 as being hungry. That makes mm -hmm. me mad because that should never be the case in America, that children are going hungry. But we know it's a reality, right? Yeah. Um, we're not really talking about what, the, what is a hunger crisis and what we need to do to deal with that. Um, I have felt moments of joy, you know, when um, it's a variety of things, when the children in my life and I can FaceTime um, right. And, you know, how they're experiencing the world, be it, you know, that they can't see their friends and um, to, to just catching up. Um, I've experienced joy like recently. I've been um, I was in North Carolina for the first day of early voting. Yeah. And I was in Florida for the first day of early voting and people wrapped like literally Miley wrapped around the corner been in line since the early morning and they're like I'm not letting anybody take my vote I'm voting you know and that just gives me such joy to see that kind of fight and that kind of spirit and you know so it's it's all of that it's all of that and um but you know mostly I'm just feeling 
I guess the emotion I'm feeling most that gives me that is born out of optimism is the emotion that comes with the the motivation to fight, but fight mm -hmm. born out of optimism, which is that I know we can do better, that we are better, mm -hmm. and we have to have the ability to see what can be unburdened by what has been. Absolutely. You know? And I relate to really everything that you just spoke on. I lost my grandmother during the pandemic and oh, um, naturally, but she, I was unable to see her for six months um, because she was in senior living where we weren't able to visit. And it wasn't the loss right. of my grandmother because she had a very fulfilled life. She grew up poor in Kentucky and moved out to LA with mm -hmm. me. She actually ran my fan club. <laughs> I like Aww. my grandma always ran my fan club before I was me, but it continued until the very end. And You're right. <laughs> what, what made me hurt was that I was unable to be with her, that she was alone. And I think that's something that we've all struggled with feeling is this detachment mm -hmm. and this loneliness. Um, and I love that you say that you feel joyful and you feel hopeful. Um, and I wanted to know that, you know, what can young people be hopeful about with Biden as our president and you as VP, how will our voices be made heard? Cause sometimes that's where yeah. my frustration comes from. Yeah. It's just not yeah. feeling heard. Right. Uh, no, and that's fair. Um, a number of things, first of all, uh, I, I strongly believe that when we look at the extension of that civil rights movement from the 60s that my parents marched in through to the movement that's happening today and people taking to the streets, I think what we know is that um, the, 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 the engagement and the, the willingness of all leaders, but in particular our young leaders, to f push to push forward change and to demand it is really critical. Mm -hmm. um, and it is critical that they are at the table. And I feel very strongly about that. And I know Joe Biden feels very strongly about it. And you can look at a variety of issues. You can look at the issue of, of the climate crisis, right? In California, we've been seeing the fires, the wildfires um, in the Gulf Coast states, you know, the storms that are just, just destroying communities in the Midwest, the floods. And having, you know, it, it has been in large part younger leaders who are forcing accountability, forcing leadership to embrace science and to invest in renewable energies and to invest in the need we all have to drink clean water and breathe clean air. Mm -hmm. um, I think about it in terms of the movement that's about reform of the criminal justice system and police accountability. I think about it in terms of the economy, you know, so many people coming out of high school and college right now and really concerned, are they going to have a job, right? Really concerned about that. And so, you know, one of the things that Joe and I are committed to is, is job creation around not only investment in, in innovation, but also investment in infrastructure, but also making sure that, for example, we forgive um, $10,000 right off the bat from student loan debt to making sure that anybody coming from a family that makes less than $125,000 can go to a four-year um, college for free, mm -hmm. including um, an HBCU. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, that we're committed to doing. But I want young leaders to be at the table. Joe wants young leaders to be at the table because the only way we're going to strengthen as a country is to make sure every voice is heard and respected Mm -hmm. And um, and not just that we, you know, kind of give people a room to, you know, window dressing, but that people actually um, get to exercise self-determination in a way that they'd make decisions about what's in Absolutely. their best interest. Yeah. And I think respect is love. Respect is power. I yeah. love that word that you use about just having respect for our young people yeah. and, and yeah. the change that we want to create. And I think a lot of people are protesting in the streets because there hasn't been progress or leadership yeah. from government. How does voting help create change on these issues? What would your administration yeah. do to ensure racial justice and equality? Yeah, thank you. So um, first of all, voting is especially, I mean, listen, there are many ways that we use our power and you know this and the power of your voice and you have a gift in that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the way that you use the power of your voice during elections is you gotta vote. Mm -hmm. People will respond to and see who's voting and then respond to their issues. That's just the way it works. Mm 
So people have to vote on, and, and I encourage everyone to go to IWillVote.com, make sure that you are registered to vote, make sure you know where you can vote, vote early, vote early, vote early. Mm -hmm. And on the issue of racial justice, look, Joe and I are committed to one, first of all, let's be clear, between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, Joe Biden says Black Lives Matter. Donald mm -hmm. Trump refuses to say it. Donald Trump stood on that debate stage in the last debate and refused to condone white supremacists and in fact said, stand back, stand by, right? Donald Trump is the one who after the, the, the Charlottesville and, and peaceful protest around racial injustice where a woman died, he, when referring to people, there was on one side peaceful protesters, on the other side neo-Nazis wearing swastikas hurling racial epithets, anti-Semitic epithets, and he said there were fine people on each side, right, on both sides. Mm -hmm. So there is no question that Donald Trump is, is awful on this issue and many other issues. In a Biden-Harris administration, we're gonna do a number of things. It's gonna be about reforming the criminal justice system. And that includes decriminalizing marijuana and expunging people with records who have been convicted. It's about saying that we need to have a, a, a policy that's about closing down those private prisons, ending cash bail, because it's really an economic justice issue as much as it is a criminal justice issue. It's gonna be about requiring police accountability, and that includes banning chokeholds and carotid holds. George Floyd would be alive today if that were the case. Requiring a national registry of police officers who break the law so that they don't just get fired in one place and then move somewhere else and get hired in another place, that there's a tracking system. But also racial justice has to be about justice in healthcare, justice in the economy, justice in education, healthcare. Black and Latino Americans are three times as likely to contract COVID and twice as likely to die from it. And you see in those populations, high rates of preexisting conditions, including diabetes, high blood pressure, and, this co and COVID has only magnified the inequities. So we're about expanding health coverage, including mental health coverage, because by the way, when we talk about health care, you know, people think that the health care is, you know, the, as though the body is just from the neck down. Well, what about health care from the neck up, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mental Absolutely. Um, you talk about economic justice. Black families own one-tenth of the wealth of white families in America. We need to deal with that and understand the historical basis. And so we are about saying, first of all, for all families, home ownership, one of the greatest sources of wealth for any American family, we're gonna give a $15,000 tax credit for first time home buyers so that you can have money to help you with down payment and closing costs. Um, in justice, let's look at what's happening in terms of our public schools, where in public schools, the predominant population are poor kids, black and brown kids, and kids of color. And in Title I schools, which are the schools that are in low-income communities, there aren't enough resources to, to nurture the God-given capacity of those children. And so we're going to triple the funding in Title I schools. Because you know what's really messed up, Miley? The way that we fund schools is based on the tax base of that community. So if you have working families who, are, who have low-income jobs, then that school district is not gonna be as funded as where rich people live. In spite of the fact that all of those children have the same God-given talent, mm -hmm. right? But not necessarily equal resources. And we know where that's gonna end up. They're not gonna end up in the same place without equal resources. And as far as I'm concerned, nobody better point to me and say, oh, well, you see this kid that came out of there and came out fine. No, we can't gauge the effectiveness of government based on the exceptional. We have to gauge how effective government is based on how everybody is doing. And right now, to your point, there are racial inequities across the board and we need to deal with that. And Joe and I are prepared to do that and committed to doing it. That I, I just learned so much from you and I <laughs> didn't know any of that information about schools. And um, yeah. I think that's really, really important. I have a last question for you because uh, running for BP takes up a lot of time. So yeah. I wanted to keep this quick, but for me, music has really been a staple, especially mm -hmm. this year, keeping it together when I felt discouraged. Yeah. So what's on your playlist and how do you get pumped up before you go out on stage for the vice presidential debates? What's your playlist <laughs> looking like? You better have party in the USA. So party in the USA. <laughs> 
Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, my walk on song is Work That by Mary J. Blige. It yes. is it, like literally every time. In fact, I was at this event recently in North Carolina and it started pouring rain, pouring rain. And everyone stayed outside because it was an outside event. And I was like, get in your cars and, and people want to stay outside. And then the song came on. And I just, I, I, it was pouring, but the energy, like all these people turning out, and then we all just started dancing in the rain. It was the best thing ever. That sounds so beautiful. <laughs> I love Mary J. I got to sing with her before, and that was like, oh. at the top, it, nothing really gets better. The bucket list, everything below. Right. Like, kind of whatever. She was just the coolest. I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank I you. I also and wore you. my best. Kamala Blazer because <laughs> taking action is always in fashion. You know what I'm saying? So I said in my vote, it was my honor filling in the circle next to your and Biden's name. I am so Thank grateful you. to you. So grateful for your service, not just in this election, but um, all of your life. Thank you so much for everything. You, and um, it was an honor to talk to you. And you. And thank you. And you take care. Thank you thank for you everything. So much. Okay, Biden I'll see you later. Forever. Okay. That's it. <laughs>